Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to see all of you on this beautiful January morning. The sun is out. The snow melts. We hope, and it's good weather for me to leave town for four days. I will be out of the office Monday through Thursday this week. And as always, if a pastoral need arises during that time, please call Jamie Henderson. Uh, even if she's not there, be sure and leave a message, 3098, and uh, we'll be sure to get right back with you. Um, thank you for that. Also, because I'm out of town, no Bible study on Thursday. We've got a good group going. We're going to hold off a week while I'm out of town and uh, resume our look at the Gospel of John. If you feel that, you can join us at any time. There's no... no reason to feel like you can't join. We're just on chapter four, and it's a wonderful time to join us, for sure. We had kind of hoped to start talk back today after church, but they're still not quite settled in the fireside room. The new TV is not installed yet, and I am not yet convinced until all the melting happens that the roof is what it should be. So uh, I don't want to put up a new TV in there until we know the roof is good. Uh, we are scheduled then to start Talk Back in two weeks. February 6th, we'll start Talk Back. We've got a wonderful series we're going to be looking at. It, it's uh, uh, by Max Lucado. You were made for this moment. A wonderful look at the book of Esther, which is not a book a lot of us have spent much time in from the Old Testament. A great story that really teaches us how we're to be God's children in a culture that doesn't much care for that status. So. I hope you join us for that. Uh, I want to welcome Kathy Hammer with us this uh, this morning. Thank you, Kathy, as always, for sharing your gifts with us as Sharon enjoys some time away. I'm sure she's having a wonderful time, whatever she's doing, and we'll uh, wait for the postcard <laughs> as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. I invite you to hear these words from Psalm 51, a Psalm of David. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the message but a very pivotal, important psalm for David. I'll read a couple of sections from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing heart. Amen. Let's pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, as we gather in this place, amid the love and fellowship of our sisters and brothers in Christ, we feel the presence of your Holy Spirit among us, leading and guiding us, and we truly pray that today the words we speak, the songs we hear and sing, and the prayers we offer might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. seated as we sing together our call to worship this morning. It's found on the front page of your bulletin, or the words are on the screen as well. Let's remain seated and sing together our call to worship, my tribute. 
together our opening hymn of praise this morning, found on the inserts in your bulletin, or the words that will be on the screen as well. Let's read and seated and sing together, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. Our joys, our concerns, our lives 
as we join together in a time of prayer, coming to God's throne and sharing with one another as well news and updates, concerns and joys. From Eaton and from others, we do have, uh, we ask ongoing prayers for Doris Dolzudelli, who is at Montage Ridge Rehab, for Shirley Otis, who is at Sloan Lake Rehab, uh, Tom Sims at Spalding Rehab. We ask ongoing prayers as well for Janine Anderson, Mary Buck, Alberta Forster, Patricia Glenn, Warren and uh, Thurman Hunt, uh, Warren is home and doing better, but uh, does appreciate your continuing prayers. For Sherry Preston, Susan Rizzoli, Elizabeth Rojas, and Bernie Schramm. Uh, Bernie is doing much better as well, hopes to be back in church potentially next Sunday, and uh, is enjoying the visits of children who are coming to be with her as well. We do ask, of course, that we continue with our prayers for our neighbors in Superior and Louisville who were so devastated by the Marshall fires. We offer prayers for the COVID situation in our community. We thank God that we are currently case-free as far as we know, but uh, we recognize the reality of, of the COVID situation here and around the world, and we offer prayers for God's blessing, blessing and healing in that. We offer ongoing prayers for all of the situations of suffering and devastation throughout our world, and especially for peace, peace in our world that all might truly learn to love and respect one another. We offer prayers for Becky Conger's daughter and family with their health concerns. How are they doing, Becky? Um, they're better. They're getting better. <coughs> Almost Good, good. Continuing prayers for them. For Alice Kaur's friend Candy with health concerns. Uh, Benita's friend Tony with health concerns. Uh, resident Valilian McGuire uh, asked for our prayers uh, related to health concerns for her daughter. And Ronnie Zeiss asked for uh, concerns for her granddaughter Fallon, who is struggling uh, with some serious health concerns, and also Fallon's mother Sharon, who is of course here to you. Yes, Rod. Uh, please pray for my brother-in-law Larry. He fell and uh, cracked an elbow and dislocated his left shoulder. Oh goodness, so prayers for Larry. Uh, certainly a, a part of our congregation in an extended way, certainly. Thank you and keep Larry in our prayers. Other joys or concerns this morning? Yes, Steve. Two prayers for my sister and her husband and family. You bet. For, for Linda and, for, the, and for, for folks here in the building, absolutely. Thank you. Other joys or concerns this morning? If not, I invite you to remain seated. Let's come into our time of prayer by singing together our call to prayer. Again, found on the answers in your bulletin, the words are on the screen. Let's remain seated and sing together. Breathe on me, breath of God, and we will do verse 3 this week. God's thrown these joys and concerns that have been raised this morning, but also bring our own unspoken joys and concerns. Let's gather now in a time of silent prayer. Father, we, your children, come together in worship and praise, thanking you for the wonderful grace and abundance that you pour into our lives that we see in the world that surrounds us. We thank you this day, Lord, for the freedom we enjoy in this country to worship as we see fit. And we pray truly, God, that your spirit of wisdom might be poured out upon all who lead us in political and service offices. In these challenging and rancorous times, may they truly remember they rise to positions of authority and power, not for their own benefit, not for power, but to act as agents of good in this world. 
We pray, Lord, for those we've named and so many others who are struggling with physical illness, facing or recovering surgery, working through physical rehab as well. We pray truly, Lord, for their strength as they fight their struggle. We pray for strength and wisdom for those who take care of them as well. And we pray especially that your healing touch might be felt in their lives. Use us, God, as well to be Christ's hands of love, showing your love in their deepest and darkest moments. And we pray, Lord, for those who, who face struggles that we don't see or don't acknowledge. We pray for those who are struggling with mental illness and addiction, with loneliness and desperation. And God, especially, we, open that, we pray that you might open our eyes to see the needs of those around us instead of simply looking away. Use our hands, use our time, use our prayer, Lord, to bless those whose struggles are hidden from the light of day. We pray, Lord, for those men and women who protect and defend us on a daily basis, those firefighters and police officers, and we join with those in New York City and around the nation who mourn yet another senseless slaying of one who responds and runs to danger. Pray, Lord, for your protection to be upon them all, bring them home safely as their duties end. We pray as well, of course, for the men and women in our military as well, who offer their lives, sometimes sacrifice their lives indeed, to protect and defend our liberties and to serve as agents of good around this world. Protect them, Lord, and bring them home safe as well. And we pray for their families who struggle in their absence too. As this new year begins, Lord, we offer special prayers for teachers. As students return to school, there are still unsettling thoughts about how education should proceed, struggles and disagreements. But in the midst of it, God, we ask for your blessings on teachers. They truly hold the future of our world in their hands. And we pray, Lord, for those, all of those who have heard the call to share Christ's love, his good news with all the world. Keep them safe, God, and bless their ministries. We pray all of these things in Christ's name, our Lord and Savior. And we join together in praying that simple prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I, uh, I love occasionally looking over the, the video of, uh, of the service as I'm editing it to upload it. And, and one of the things I know that the, the, the seasons are progressing is the band, the band of light now goes over my head instead of blinding me. So we must be moving towards spring. We have so much to be grateful for. And this week, I received a letter from Community Ministry, many of you. No community ministry, that, that's the, the organization we work with on our food drive, on our clothing drives, that we worked with as well for um, our Christmas gifts this year. They sent us a thank you for all that we had done in 2021, and I wanted to highlight some of it. Uh, again, they thanked us for adopting 24 children for the Sharon Tree Christmas gifts. We donated 42 uh, packages of new socks, underwear, hats, and gloves for their children's clothing bank. During the school supply drive, we filled four backpacks. And the most amazing thing of all to me is we donated over the year 3,687 pounds of food. And they put a value on that per IRS tax rules of $7,152. I think I mentioned before that our community is the second biggest donor 
to the community ministry food bank, and, uh, not counting grocery stores, but for schools and churches. Uh, we truly do impact our neighbors by our love and generosity. And that's a lesson in point. Uh, we take our offering, of course, your chance if you're able to financially support the missions and ministries of this church. But even more than that, it's a call for you to consider how you can bless others with your time, your talent, and your treasure. In that spirit, I invite our ushers forward as we receive this morning's offering. <laughs> sing together this morning's doxology, thanking God for the blessings poured into our lives. time in our service where we open our hearts, our minds, and our lives to hearing God's word. I invite you to remain seated for our hymn of preparation this morning. You'll find it again on the inserts in your bulletin. The words will be on the screen. Let's remain seated and sing together, Change My Heart, O oh God.
Our scripture readings today come from the 11th and 12th chapters of 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with them. They ravaged the Ammonites and the siege, Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about in the roof of the king's house. And he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported. This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period, then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. And our second reading from the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel, verses 1 to 9. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many, very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his uh, own clock or her to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Oh, loving and gracious God, as we gather today, open our ears, our hearts, and our lives truly to hear your word and will for us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Our first two messages in our sermon series this month on this theme of Never Too Late had, had something in common. They both involved stories of men late in life being led by God in a new direction, guided to do a, a new thing, despite their age or any other excuses that they might have come up with. This week is different. King David's never too late story goes in a different direction, one that I think applies to all of us at some point in our life. If you were to ask a religious Jew, especially one who's lived in or spent much time in Israel, who the most important historical people are to their faith and to their nation, they would immediately throw out three names. Abraham, Moses, and King David. We've already looked at the first two, of course, Abraham and Moses. Abraham, because he listened to God, even at a very advanced age, left the familiar, the comfortable, and, and went on to the unfamiliar, to that promised land. And thus he is the patriarch of the nation, the father of Israel. Moses, because he listened to God, again at an older age, and heard God's call instead of those doubts and fears that were in his own mind, he became the human agent of deliverance of God's chosen people from slavery in Egypt. And then he heard God again, and he delivered God's law to the people and the people to God's law. 
because of that, he's known as the patriarch, the, the father of the Jewish faith, of Judaism. But King David is different. His story goes in a, a very different direction from Abraham and Moses. From the beginning of his story, as a very young adolescent boy shepherd who is called to be the next king, he has always followed God faithfully. And from the beginning of his story with God, it's clear that God loves him. He blesses him. First Samuel even tells us that God has called him a man after my own heart. God saves him from, from King Saul's murderous plots. He elevates him to the kingship. He prospers the nation. He enlarges the borders. David unites the 12 tribes of Israel who up to this point have had very little to do with each other unless they were in battling one another. He, he consolidates the worship of God to one place, to Jerusalem. And he also makes that city the capital uh, of the nation, the center of political power too. His reign, as you look over the history of ancient Israel, is clearly the golden age of the nation. It's no wonder he's still a figure who's greatly admired by the nation, by the Jewish people, even now. But then you come to this story we're looking at today. The account that Don read a part of for us, David gives into temptation. He, he sleeps with the wife of one of his most trusted soldiers, impregnates her, and ultimately kills her husband to cover up his misdeed. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Except while David would have likely gotten away with this misdeed and his murderous plot if it hadn't been for God intervening through the prophet Nathan to convict him of his sin and lead him to repentance. David's sin is literally as great as there could be, but, but his story shows us that truly it's never too late to repent. Repent. <laughs> now there's a word we hate. It's a word that's out of fashion, but, but repentance, whether it's fashionable or not, is at the heart of our relationship to God. Without repentance, we can't turn to God. We don't, we don't receive or even seek the grace and forgiveness that's offered to us through Christ for our own sins, our own misdeeds. Let's dig into this story of mighty King David at his lowest point just a little bit. See if we can't see how it applies to our own lives too. See if we can't understand why God inspired the author of 2 Samuel to include this story of sin and stain on David's reputation, that man after God's own heart in this account. It starts simply enough in verse 1 of chapter 11, Don read for us, with the words that almost sound like a once upon a time from your favorite childhood fairy tale. But the words of 2 Samuel pack a punch. They're a subtle powerful criticism of the man that King David is becoming and, and a criticism of the path that he will soon take. It says, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Uh, springtime really was the time when kings mustered their troops in that era and in that region to go out to war in times of crisis and struggle in the nation. It was logical. The, the winter rains had ceased. The, the ground became passable. And nearly all of the able-bodied men in the nation who would be serving as soldiers were also farmers. In late spring, that's the, era, the time that we're referring to here, the seeds would have been planted for the next crop but that labor-intensive harvest wouldn't be there for many months still. That gave them enough time to fight a war, or at least part of a war. And if it went longer than that, both sides with the same reality would simply withdraw and then come back and resume the battle again the next spring. That's a little bit of what's happening here. The Ammonites the year before had, had caused some hostilities, some skirmishes, and the battle had stopped, but it resumed. And they went in and they raided and gained a great victory. So as the author puts it, in the spring of that year, the time when the kings go out to battle, off they go. Except, except this king. King David couldn't be bothered to go with them. He'd always led the troops in previous battles, but this time for some reason he stayed at home where he was comfortable and safe. 
Maybe after seeing his own success as a king, he'd kind of think of himself as irreplaceable, too valuable to risk life and limb leading the men in battle. Maybe it was you know, just too comfortable back in Jerusalem to be much interested in going out on a muddy, dirty trail, sleeping outside, eating K-rate rations or whatever they had for military food back then, and risk your neck at the same time. In any case, in that simple line, the author of 2 Samuel lets us know David isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. He stopped being the kind of king that God foresaw when he put him on the throne. Success and abundance have killed off David's humility, his empathy, and that's an age-old story, if there ever was one. And it's also a good lesson for us to look at and, and bring as a warning of our own, too. Uh, a lack of humility, a concern for ourselves above everything else, will always lead us away from God's will. It will put us on a path to sin and trouble. And sure enough, that's what happens to David. Now, picture the scene from David's palace. It's, it's on the high point in town, and it's a big, tall, magnificent structure. There are even some, what they think, are remnants of it still. But like every other house around back then, of course, it didn't have central air conditioning. <laughs> and it gets hot in the afternoon there. So, so David, in his quest for comfort and luxury, goes up to the rooftop, to a couch there to take a little afternoon nap, siesta, if you will. From that roof, he has an amazing view, literally looking down on every other house around him. And those houses around him all belong to important people in the royal court and the nation, political counselors, high priests, generals, and important soldiers that time. And what does he see as he's strolling around the rooftop? Not exactly napping now, but looking down instead on his neighbors. Actually, well, his neighbors, the men anyway, are pretty much all out on the battlefield when David has chosen to stay home and look around. But there's David up on the roof looking down on the rooftops and the grounds where the women are now left alone. David is, quite frankly, looking for trouble. Don't let some of the language in that first reading that Don gave us about this part of the story mislead you between translating it into English and the author's original intentional couching of the language and nice, polite metaphors, it's easy to think that David just happened to see a woman, no fault of his own. Bathsheba, wife of one of his leading soldiers, and as it turns out too, granddaughter of perhaps his most trusted advisor. And don't think David has no idea who that beautiful woman was that he spied bathing on the roof. Jerusalem was not a big city, and, and David certainly knew who lived where on his own block. He knew who he was looking at. So when 2 Samuel says he sent men out to inquire about her, don't think that he was just being neighborly. He wanted to find out, was her husband home? What she was doing. And that's obvious the minute they come back and tell him that, as he thought, she was the wife of an important member of his military, a man outdoing what David himself should be outdoing at that point. And he undertakes his plan. He now sends messengers to her house and tells her to come see him post haste. By the way, commentators, including some that I like a lot, try to make the case that Bathsheba is somehow complicit in this scene. Don't go there. David has all the power. She has none. When the king summons you, you go. And in her case, when the king determines to have his way with you, it happens. And the result is disastrous for Bathsheba, for Uriah, her husband, for David, quite possibly for the entire nation. Bathsheba becomes pregnant from the incident. Because of the timing, there can be no doubt that it's David's child. So David, now definitely not acting as a man after God's own heart, concocts a plan to bring Uriah home and make him think that the child is his. That fails. So he goes on to an even more evil plan B, with no concern except for himself, his own status and reputation and power. He has Uriah intentionally killed in battle and proceeds to take Bathsheba as his wife, his seventh wife, by the way. I'm sure he breathed a sigh of relief when it was reported to him that his plan had worked, 
that Uriah was dead, probably gave himself, you know, a nice pat on the back. It's good work. That peccadillo is done now. And he slept safe and sound that night, which with whichever of the wives he chose to accompany him to bed. No restless sleep for David caused by this recognition of sin. No, no shouts of repent, repent, repent echoing in his mind. At least not yet. Boy, that's a word that's gone out of fashion in our day, isn't it? Repent. Most folks, including preachers, don't really like it too much. It negatively impacts our self-esteem, we might say. It leads us to believe that our own choices and schemes might not really be the best thing. They might not be God's plan. It drives home the truth that God is God and we are not. But it's kind of unfair to the word. Repent is such a simple word after all. And its meaning isn't that hard to comprehend either. It simply means to turn around. To take a 180 from the path that you've been on. Turn back to God. Resume your journey on God's path and God's will. It's a simple word. Simple meaning, but always so hard to do sometimes. Repentance, recognizing the sin and failure in your own life with a clarity and honesty that we don't like very much. Confessing that sin to God, to others that we've hurt through our actions, and finally, turning from it, changing our behavior. That's what God seeks from each of us when we, and it's inevitable, isn't it, when we stray from God's will, when we turn from God's love. Edwin Orr was Billy Graham's biographer, and he tells an interesting story from the early 1960s Graham was addressing a meeting in Beverly Hills of the leading citizens and the rich folks from that neighborhood. Ironically, in that respected and esteemed group that day was a notorious gangster named Mickey Cohen. He was, after all, a resident of Beverly Hills. He kind of belonged there. Probably thought it would be a good business opportunity, social connections, who knows. And Graham, as he always did, no matter what the setting, what the crowd was, he preached a message of God's call to repentance, his offer of grace in Christ. Cohen seemed interested in the message. He even stayed after the meeting to talk further with Graham, but he didn't make any commitment to Christ that day. Someone else would attend, though, a longtime supporter of Billy Graham's and Cohen's next door neighbor, continued to talk to him, urging him to make that commitment to Christ. And one day he did, kind of. That neighbor prayed that prayer with Cohen that day, probably the same prayer that Graham had prayed with him years before when he'd accepted Christ. He excitedly contacted Graham to tell him about Cohen's seeming conversion. But the neighbor noticed as the months went by, there really wasn't any change apparent in Cohen's life, no fruits of repentance and conversion, if you will. He continued to have notorious affairs, even openly bringing women up the front walk of his house for all to see. He continued in all of the previous criminal activities and businesses he would always had. Disappointed, that neighbor contacted Billy Graham to report on the situation. And Graham decided that this was worth a personal call. So he telephoned Mickey Cohen directly. After some initial chat, he asked him how his life had changed since he'd become a Christian, since he'd accepted Christ. Cohen's frank reply stunned Graham. He said he'd heard about and even read in Graham's own publications about things like this famous guy who was a Christian cowboy and, and this man who was a Christian senator and this well-known woman who was a Christian actress, so he didn't see any reason why he couldn't be Mickey Cohen Christian gangster. <laughs> Graham tried to reason with him, talking about the need of turning from sin and that old life to no avail. The call ended with no good conclusion, and, and Cohen actually was soon convicted of tax evasion and racketeering. He spent most of his final years on Alcatraz. But the encounter drove home a point to Billy Graham, a truth that he incorporated from then on into his own crusades and books. The fact is, or quotes Graham's writing to his team, repentance is the missing note in modern day Christianity. We don't really know how Long King David's peaceful bliss lasted until that call to repentance in the form of the prophet Nathan came knocking at his door. But when it came, it came in a way that not only knocked at his door, it knocked him off his spiritual and moral high horse. Nathan confronts David with a technique that I love, with, with a story, a metaphor, designed to bring David to his own conviction of his own wrongdoing and sin. 
Nathan tells him the tale of a poor man and his family who have nothing but a little lamb, a ewe, that they value and love dearly, almost a member of the family. The ewe is more than a pet, though. This little lamb is more than a pet. It's also likely the key to the family's future, as it, it could be bred and really provide for them in the years to come. But a rich man not wanting to spend his own money to slaughter one of his own lambs to feed an important visitor takes what is the poor man's heart and soul, that little lamb, and slaughters it for the meal. David is outraged, of course, even in the midst of sin. For David and for all of us, that part of that image of God that is within us that lingers to the bitter end is a sense of justice, of right and wrong. And David knows that how this story that he's been told played out is unjust. That rich man should be killed for what he has done to that poor, powerless man in his band that David argues. Imagine his shock when Nathan, Nathan simply says the words that bring David up cold. You are that man, David. Nathan continues and reminds him that God has blessed him with literally everything. Power, wealth, success. And that God would have even given him more beyond that if he wished. But instead, David chose to take from a man without power. Uriah, take his heart and soul, his wife, Bathsheba, the man who has it all, King David, wants even more. Never mind the consequences, I want it, I want it. That was his battle cry from the luxury of the palace rooftop while his subjects, his neighbors, Uriah, are out truly in battle. And here we have another lesson in this repentance thing. God uses the people around us, the people that we love, the people we admire to help steer us back onto the right path to bring us to repentance too. When someone you love, when someone you respect takes you aside and points out truthfully and selflessly that you're going astray, listen instead of immediately being defensive and rejecting. David listened, and he earned again that title of a man after God's own heart. He repented publicly. He, he wrote that Psalm 51 that we heard a portion of as we opened worship today, pleading with God to blot out his transgressions, to create a clean heart, a new and right spirit within him. David, after almost the worst sin you can imagine, adultery, murder, theft, and the list goes on, David teaches us today that it's never too late to repent. It's never too late to turn it around and return to the Lord. It wasn't too late for David, and it's never too late for us either. No matter how far we've gone astray, no matter how far we've drifted. And there's no better good news than that that I can give you today. In Christ, for you, for everyone, it's never too late. No matter the transgressions to come home. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we confess that we hate to confess. We confess, God that we keep the sin within our lives. We love the sin often, God, as we've been called to love you and to love our neighbor. Forgive us, God. Truly help us turn from the path of self-absorption and sin to your path of love and grace. Give us that strength today with your Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. I invite you to remain seated as we sing together now our closing hymn. Again, you'll find it on the inserts in your bulletin. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing together, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. And we'll do verses 1, 2, and 4 this morning. Love Divine, All Love's Excelling.
always try to tie my benediction somehow into the message, but I'm not going to tell you to go forth and repent on your way to the elevator. I'm going to tell you to go forth and repent. We all fall short of what God wants for us, God's best for us. By the way, that's truly the definition of sin, falling short of what God wants. God calls us to receive grace, mercy through Christ, and that process involves us realizing we've fallen short and accepting that grace and turning from that sin. I invite you today to do that. As you go forward, to receive these words of blessing and benediction. O oh, loving God, as we go from this place, we go forth with hearts, with hearts we pray to be made clean, with spirits that are new and right. We pray, God, that we might be your disciples as we go forth. Light our paths and guide our footsteps, O oh God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.